First of all, um, I want to thank uh, all of our people. We have up here Drusilla Cornell, Kenan Ferguson, Jerome Combe, and Philip Howard. Um, uh, uh, some of our people had to, to go and, and, and do things today, and I'm sorry for that. But I thought it would be good, you know, we've had a, a nice day, a long day, a lot's been said. I thought it would be good to sort of ask this, some very simple questions. Um, and, uh, you know, we talked a lot about problems. Uh, I'd like to know if, to the, what extent, and I want to try and keep these as short as possible, what you think we're fighting for, right? I mean, what is it that you think we need, how do we articulate that positive vision of what it is we are fighting for today? Uh, if we, I mean, we've also asked this question of unmaking of Americans, and there's been an implicit question of remaking Americans. Um, Anne and Joan in the, and Kenan in the pragmatism panel were talking about, do we want to remake Americans? Is there, you know, is there a pluralism or is there an American? So I'd, I'd like to know, A, just simply, do you think we need to fight for some overarching, whether it's rich, I mean, really vibrant or more loose, some idea of America? And, and if so, what is it? And if not, What's lost if we don't? So maybe I'd start with Philip. Yep. Oh, can you please come up. Yes, I. That's great. <laughs> God forbid. I will tell you that Anne Lauterbach is nobody's. She is tr truly her own, unique, American, Emersonian. Uh, we'll go further. All right, I, I'm going to let Philip start um, and, and ask him this question. It's a very simple question, right? Is there something we should be fighting for that me, in America, as America? Uh, yes, and I think it's the, uh, it's the freedom that was described by or, or sought, described by Tocqueville, sought by, um, um, sought by Emerson, um, and explained by Arendt, and it's, it's a freedom of people to uh, not to be, but to do. And, um, and we've lost the sense that we can own, not only to an extent, our own choices, but also own and create our own communities and growing for our own nation. And uh, these institutions and global forces have taken a life of their own, and th that sphere of the individual has narrowed materially in not only my view in the last 50 years, and we need to fight to get so it back. Let me, let, me, so let me try and push this, and, and, and I'm going to... You said freedom to do, right? Yes. What, what is, how do we... There's a, there, one could imagine this being a libertarian position, which may be your position. I don't know. It's not my position. I I, I'm just asking, yeah. what, what, is, what is it that we're, is freedom to do something on a local level, a personal level, a community level, a governmental level? Where do you put this? How do we... Every level, and, and every level is chosen, is chosen by the individual. Um, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that has happened, and not just big corporatist influences like Walmart, people are talking about that have shrunk the sphere of people to, to Greta Main Street, for example. Um, but, but also just the sphere of, of, of the importance of authority, which, which again, Hannah Arendt talked about. If, if you lose authority structures, you no longer have red lights and green lights in a crowded society, then all of a sudden you get gridlock and no one can go anywhere. You can use that metaphor in hundreds of areas in our society right now. And so, because for reasons she stated so clearly that liberals think that the progressive decline of authority means greater freedom, that's a, almost a direct quote, um, is completely backwards. Yes, but she also wrote an essay called What is Authority? Where she said it really should be called What Was Authority? Because she thought authority was no longer really possible. 
in the modern age. Uh, all right. Well, I mean, you know more about it than I do. No, I, 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 I didn't read her that way. But, but in any event, I actually viewed uh, her analysis as hopeful that if we can actually understand that in living together, we need uh, green lights and yellow lights and ways of holding them accountable as well. We need legitimate authority. Then all of a sudden, all sorts of things unfold. As a practical base, you know, matter, schools can be orderly and infrastructure can get rebuilt. But, you know, and then communities can be formed in the spirit of the people who live in them, not by inertia. Well, I, I would just like to add to that. Put the microphone. I, it's not, can, is that right? Yeah, it's good. Oh, uh, uh, what, what I did say be, earlier, but it's, it, it, to me it's, 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 it's essential. When, when Aaron talks about the uh, grammar and syntax of political freedom, it's, it's a very, very odd uh, way of speaking, n n number one. I, to me, in spite of linguists, I don't think the terms grammar and syntax are terribly clear defined ever but the, what she means by the grammar of, of, of is, is sort of the basic conditions if you will of political action of political freedom and that is simply a plurality of, of, of men are necessary uh, of men and women I think the, the men and women thing is more of a German thing than, a, than a, a, anything else uh, but um, I mean, because of the word, um, the the uh, and 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 the and the syntax is the structure, particularly the moving structure. So, if you have the basic condition as the plurality of human beings involved in political action, and you have the base, basic structure of, of the movement of it or the power of it as promising. We should think maybe a little bit about problem. What wasn't that maybe what was wrong with the Arab Spring? There was so much enthusiasm for the Arab Spring at one time, but no promises were kept. N none. Now there are other examples of promises that Guantanamo Bay wasn't shut, the Red Land Line in the land of the sands of Syria wasn't uh, promise made. Was what wasn't kept. There, there are all kinds of. But I, frankly, I think her analysis of when power uh, fades in a, in a polity, in a republic, if you will, is, is right on. I want to, I was going to ask Joan, you, you mentioned in your talk this expansion of religion or of God as pragmatism, I think, um, the yeah, widening, widens, the field widens the field of search for God. I'm wondering if when we think about what we're fighting for, are we trying to fight for a new God? I think we're trying, I think we might think of fighting, not fighting, but uh, arguing, suggesting uh, a new idea of God uh, that expands so that, again, going back to James, a suggestion of a polytheistic rather than a monotheistic model, because if you have a monotheistic model, there's always going to be one thing that you're imitating, and with polytheism, the shoemaker has a god, the goatherd has a god, then those people are going to talk to one another about their, about their various gods in their pantheons. And uh, I think that it also, there's, a, there's a, an underpinning idea that has been lost in our understanding of pragmatism uh, that comes from Kant, that Peirce, when he uh, wanted to reclaim the name pragmatism because it had gotten uh, diluted, renamed his own version pragmaticism. And that was particularly to reclaim the pragmatish from Kant. And the pragmatish, as opposed to the praktisch, has to do with understanding the forms and motions of nature and the universe and trying to accommodate our forms of thought and our languages and our understandings as beings to that, not only to the expedient every day. 
So I think that the expansion of the idea of God has to include the uh, nature itself, the planet itself, the movement, you know, going to the cosmic order and understanding as much of that as possible, I think, was James's suggestion. And I think that the national conversation should open to include that. I, I, I mean, it's, I'm trying to articulate, I'm trying to think in my own mind how that fits with this claim that Jerry and I were making about Arendt to some degree that the original idea of an American constitution was of non-sovereignty that would allow many different so many different power centers, but not one ultimate one. And I'm wondering if that's consistent. In a sense, I, I don't want to name it, and you know, Charles just showed up, and I, I'm not sure if we want to call that libertarian or not, or, or how you think that, but how is that, or is that, I mean, are you, I think are it's you close? anti-libertarian. You think it's anti-libertarian. Can you explain why? Because the more we learn to identify with other, the more we understand the more the the more mean egotism in Emerson's terms vanishes, and so the more we learn to respect others in all of their articulations and all of their forms, even to the things of something like animal rights now, and including every form of cognizance to what we have as consciousness, knowing that we're continuous with it. Um, that's such a beautiful vision, but what, what it leaves out is the human figures that we disagree with and therefore can't possibly, maybe can't have them on our field, our expanding field. In other words, the expanding field from the creature to the human to the cosmos seems very wonderful, but the expanding field that includes people with whom we definitely disagree how do we get them to be part of our politics in any kind of constructive as opposed to uh, agonistic way? Well, I think, uh, you know, again, Jane Steger's idea of you know, vigorous pedagogy and uh, finding common points with those who are most different, understanding that we are all, in fact, animals. And, you know, that there's that wonderful passage in William James, again, uh, I forget which chapter, I think, Lecture six, where he uh, talks about the, the shift, and Ross Posner talks about this as well, well that we, the earth must reclaim its rights, and the, that the axis of philosophy, philosophy has to shift from the vertical back to the horizontal, which is again an Emersonian idea that James develops. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a very, I mean, to me, this is an absolutely crucial point of discussion that. Anne and Joan are here having, because it does raise a question that Charles, I think, is very interested in, if I understand everyone correctly, which is to what extent in our more plural and tolerant and open view of an expanded God, we then say there's an understanding we can reach about the cosmos or about nature that we will come to in sort of a knowledge basis, or we take a much more humble view and say, let different people disagree and find points of consensus in which we actually allow people to disagree about the most fundamental things, exactly. how they're going to be married, whether they're going to be married, etc. which would be, as I understand it, a more libertarian approach. And are, am I hearing in you a more libertarian strain? Is that, or are you going to resist that? Um, well, since you've already said that I belong to nobody, I certainly don't belong to any particular uh, creed. A strain. A strain. Uh, strain. Um, uh, I, I am I'm not interested in the label at all. I'm just trying to think about how to think about this. I mean, it's a double think. Um, and, uh, and I'm anxious about the, the ways in which panels like this address in this rather wonderful way very important problems, but the, or ideas, uh, but the disconnect between this kind of discussion and my thinking about how does, how the question I asked on the panel, you know, how does all of this 
actually become a practice or a practical thing. And I understand that there are many people who are mobilized to do things, but I actually don't understand where, when and where that mobilization is going to make the kinds of differences that I think have to be made very soon in almost every register that we can think of. I don't know how that's going to happen. And it, and it makes me think, just one other thing, and when you were asking the first question that the, about, we were talking about authority um, and the promises that are made in a rent sense that um, one of the great critiques of, of Occupy was that they weren't making any demands, uh, which is kind of the other side of authority. You know, like, okay, here you are. What are your demands? And, and because you don't have any demands, you have no efficacy. And, and I thought that was um, uh, a very uh, um, short-sighted and un, un, undermining way to deal with people who actually deliberately didn't have any demands. It wasn't like they couldn't think of anything. It was that, no, we're not actually in the business of making demands. Anyway. Um, so, Drusilla, I mean, I asked this basic question, what are we fighting for? I, I know you have a sh sense of that. Um, I know it probably is long, but if we could briefly, what do you, what do you think we are fighting for? Um, I, I think I would say that we're fighting for a society which has, um, recognizes the equal dignity of all human beings. We can talk about whether that includes animals. And for a society that is compassionate. If I were in South Africa, I would say we were fighting for Ubuntu, which includes both. But I'm not in South Africa right this second. Uh, as a result of that, it's connected to two different ways of thinking about freedom to do. One is the imaginary domain. You can connect that to Hannah Arendt's natality. We do need to have the space to reimagine who we are and what we're doing and all of our complex identifications precisely because of Arendt's notions of givenness. And that not only includes sexual, uh, but it also includes racial, it includes um, ethnic and includes linguistic. Uh, so we're fighting for the dignity connected to the imaginary domain and we're fighting for capability freedom, which would insist that each person have equal chance to fully recognize their capabilities that comes from Amara to Sen, which this is then concluded with the idea of compassion, which everybody should have basic functionings. Nobody should ever fall below the level of basic functionings and that demands obligation and compassion. So dignity is what we're fighting for, connected to a certain complex notion of freedom. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ken, and that really, you know, J Jerry Cohn and some other people, in, you know, asked, when I asked you what we're fighting for, and you said unfreedom in some way, and the, the question of totalitarianism was brought up, right? That, that there's in some way, you know, in many ways, I thought that your idea of, of intensification and Arendt's idea, as Jerry explained it, of virtuosity melded, but you said that there was reasons to switch from freedom to unfreedom. But I wonder, you know, when Drusilla brings up dignity, I wonder to what extent you worry at all or not or some that in moving from freedom to unfreedom to habit to these other ideas of meaning that are thought through intensification and commitments as opposed to freedom. We lose a protection, we lose a barrier to a real kind of unfreedom that none of us would want. I'm wondering if that's a worry you have. Um, yeah, I think we do have to always open ourselves up and part, part of the, the question of that pluralism is that there is always danger involved. In it. But the goal I think overall is not a, a different kind of totality of the, you know, the Volk or the nation instead of the individual. It's a sense of an expanded version of publics which are based in interdependence and engagement. So to take just two quick examples, one from this morning would be when we talk about something like a corporation, we talk about those as being individual things as being a, the realm of the private. They're not. They, a corporation is chartered by the government. It is a government-created entity. 
And as such, it is dependent on governmentality and law to do the things that a corporation does, which is protect its investors from levels of liability, for example. That's an interdependent relationship. And at a more intimate level, one from, I think, more this afternoon, I would turn again to the family, that we aren't all only adolescents saying, let me be free. We are babies, we are children, we are married, we are partners, we are caretakers, and we are elderly. And all of those entail levels of engagement and responsibility and connection that are about kinds of publics, but they're not freedoms. Uh, thank you. I want to I want to open up the questions in a second. But Charles, uh, you open your book a quote I put up very early in the morning, saying we, we need to that we're in danger of having America no longer be America. You present an unbelievably bleak vision, and I was hearing you talk afterwards where you said, "I don't see any way out of this. We're in a caste system, and the caste is going to last." Is that? I mean. You know, when I ask this question, what are we fighting for? Is it worth fighting at this point? Or are you sort of social science, it's over. We, we give in to the data. And could you bring a mic? I know, can you share your mic with your son? By the way, I've, I've been out in the lobby for the last 40 minutes. And I've missed the transition between the four of us. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Um, well, the, the way I frame my own views on this and what we're fighting for is with what I refer to as the American Project. And the American Project I take as the, the, the one at the founding, which I define as uh, an attempt to demonstrate that human beings can be left alone to live their lives as they see fit, uh, as individuals and as families and as communities, as long as they accord the same freedom to everyone else with the government providing the environment for a peaceful setting and otherwise standing aside. And if that is your definition of the American project, it ended constitutionally in 1937, uh, when in Helvering the uh, Supreme Court said that Congress may spend money on the general welfare and not, eliminate, uh, not limited to the enumerated powers and, and a set of <laughs> Supreme Court decisions that came after that. That's where it ended technically. But it took a while for that end to limits on government to take hold, and that really occurred in the 1960s and 70s and thereafter. So the American project, as I see it, is dead. I'm, I'm living in a post-American America, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, however, in the new book, um, which I just finished yesterday, I've got good news. Congratulations. Uh, thank you. I've, I've got good news, which is that there is a way that we can restore some of the best aspects of the American project in a new incarnation. And it involves massive civil disobedience. But it'll work. Uh, well, once you, once you hear the details. It's, uh, so you've become a radical. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm coming out of that closet. Do any of the panelists up here want to ask a question of any of the other panelists, or should we open it up? Are there any questions from the audience? Do we have a mic in the audience? Yes, we do. Right down here. We'll take one right here. Um, I think that there is a, a, a organizing principle in front of us. It's called climate change. It's called pollution of our environment. It's called all of those things, and I think what you're seeing with diseases and so forth is just a beginning, and, and refugees, and all of this has nothing to do with a nation state solving those problems. It has to do with the whole world getting together. It is, or after all, these are all world problems which we've helped to create. Also, what about nuclear weapons? They're sitting there. We're, we're imperfect human beings. We need to get rid of them. I think there are plenty of organizing principles that are really like the sword of Damocles right over our head. Thank so um, if I understand it as a question, there's a sense of, uh, some people have talked about this today, a new idealism, a new activism. George Packer mentioned it at the end of his talk. Um, 
and I know it came up in a couple of other talks. Is there anyone who wants to, and I only you know, hold one right now, to speak to this sense of whether there is a new idealism and how it's working, Jerry? Well, I know, I'd just like to ask this gentleman, uh, how, how do you think this can be dealt with? By, are you suggesting that this be, ought to be some kind of world government? Well, I'm suggesting, I'm suggesting that, first of all, a panel that's presenting a question of, you know, where is America today? And secondly, you know, what is freedom and what is, what is something we can fight for, which I don't think the word fight should be, what, what is something we can, we can organize ourselves as a Nicely community. struggle for. Struggle for, okay. It's, well, it's yeah. amazing, excuse me, it's amazing to me that the overall problem of climate change and pollution of our seas and our, and our earth and, and all the droughts and fires and all these things it doesn't seem to have any well, you, part you, of your okay. consciousness. Jerry? Sir, the, 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 I mean, one, the, one thing I would think of, it was um, in, a long time ago, St. Augustine lived, but when he said that a just war should be war, fought not for fear or hatred of your enemy, but for love of your neighbor, that's actually what it seems to me you are kind of talking about. Um, you know, oh, one sec, a, Philip. Yeah, I mean, there's a, ideally a, a culture evolves. We, we change our values, we have changed our values, and the molecules uh, bounce around, and we, some way or another, with conflict and other things, end up in a, in, in a place that, that that we deserve and hopefully is, is better than the one we're in. Um, I don't think that the molecules uh, are bouncing around for some of the reasons Charles has talked about in other ways. We're sort of um, uh, shackled with a number of things, some of the things I write about, bureaucratic structures and legal structures. The political system doesn't seem to be working. Um, and, and there's no discussion of a concept which your question implies, which is, it used to be important, uh, Gibbon talked about it. Um, uh, most people who talk about a working society talk about this concept of moral authority. Not power, but moral authority. People, uh, people, individuals, mainly people, but sometimes groups, who, who people believe are saying what they actually believe, and they're saying it for the, because they believe it to be for the common good, to use your, and, you would be hard pressed to name on one hand people in this society who actually have, you know, or even aspire to. The courage their of their authority. convictions. And if we want to deal with environmental issues and such like this, our country, the most powerful country on earth, has to do that not by creating a world government, which I think would be Terrible. chaos, uh, but, by, but by achieving moral authority, along with all of the other things we already have going for us, so that when we say things about, uh, you know, sort of nurturing the fish in the sea, to use one example, people will think we're not doing it just so that we can eat all the fish. Okay. Next. That, that we're doing it for the whole world. There's a question over on the side over here. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I was glad to hear Mr. Murray say uh, you're interested in civil disobedience. That's excellent. <laughs> um, but I guess I, I mean, I think, I think everyone knows this, but uh, the United States was built on genocide, racism, um, <laughs> um, uh, the exploitation of workers and poor people. Um, and so I don't have a nostalgia for the America that was. I think that there were principles that we tried for, some people tried for, but there was never a time in this country that we didn't have that as our foundation and the resources that we have built this country on were on the backs of those folks and imperialism. And I kind of feel like we've, um, we, our chickens are, have come home to roost. Um, but I do think that we have leaders who have moral authority and okay. speak with conviction. The, the elders from the UN, Mary Robinson, Nelson Mandela, I mean, we, they're legend. Um, but uh, I I'm guess gonna... my que question yep. is, yes, I know. Um, is in that context of where we came from, how this whole conversation 
it's like, how do we take ownership of our past and then move forward? Because I don't think we've done that. We don't have a truth and reconciliation, for instance. All right. Um, you know, the question is, I, I'm not sure, but uh, how do we uh, define an ideal? How do we move forward? Um, let me take, is there someone who wants to, Drusilla, you want to say anything quick? I just want to try to combine a short answer to, to the two questions. The first is, um, Roger, you were asking what we would fight for in the United States. And one very important aspect of the original Constitution is that there is no such thing as America except as a geographic designation. If we were citizens of the United States and there was no homogeneity and no basis for citizenship based in blood, I think this is still a very important idea. So I never identify as an American. I've got a Paraguayan daughter. She's just as American as I am. And she's a citizen of both countries. I think on some issues we need a planetary perspective. Now, whether we're going to ever have a world government or not, uh, we are moving in Africa and South America and Europe to kinds of communities. It's very fraught. It's very difficult. There's certain questions like pollution, nuclear disarmament, that have to be dealt with on a planetary perspective. Um, and I certainly follow Nelson Mandela, but the, any country that has nuclear war is not respecting our weapons, respecting the dignity of all others. First day of presidency, he disarmed his nuclear weapon, which Israel had given South Africa, and threw them into the ocean. Uh, in terms of fighting against all those things, I do think we need positive ideals. That's why I tried to lay out what I considered those ideals to be. Because without them, we are fighting against certain things, but without a sense of what that direction is. And in terms of us taking responsibility, I think that the opposite, if you believe freedom is equal dignity and connected in some ways to freedom, part of that freedom is responsibility and more of responsibility. And as a citizen of the United States, I take responsibility for all the violations of other people's sovereignty, that we have engaged in throughout history, starting way back with Spanish-American wars. That blood is on my hands, and I accept it. Are there students? Are there students? Uh, uh, yeah, let, let's do these two right here, one and two. Um, yeah, for, for questions. Uh, so I'm interested in hearing the solutions that some of you may have towards uh, getting closer to this idea of freedom that you're all talking about, how we can gain more uh, equality between uh, people and dignity and, I mean, Charles Murray's idea of the bubble. How do we break that bubble? Uh, Maybe we'll have a, two answers to this because I think it's a question. Charles, tell more about your civil disobedience. What, what's, who are you calling for to be civil disobedient and what would they do? I haven't come up with my one-minute description. Of the, I'll, I'll, I'll put it very quick. I'll, I'll give you a quick example of what motivated the book. Uh, we have a friend who runs uh, a plant nursery uh, in a small town in Virginia. And uh, he employs uh, Central Americans, uh, like all plant nurseries around the country do these days. But what makes him different is that uh, he documents them. He, he pays for their visas, he pays for their transportation, uh, and he's done the right thing there. And as a result of that, he has made himself a visible target to the bureaucrats. And so he is constantly harassed um, and pays large fines for such things as he doesn't, uh, you know, he, he doesn't have enough uh, Native American workers, people born here. Well, he can't get them. You know, he advertises for them and they can't get them, he gets fined for not having them, so forth and so on. And at one point, uh, he, he said uh, to one of the men who was harassing him, he said, okay, I'm going to fight this. And the response was, if you fight this, we'll put you out of business. And he knew that was true. And so he didn't. And what I wanted at that point was for a man on a white horse to come riding over the hill in a pinstripe suit carrying a briefcase and get off the horse and say, we are taking this man's case. We will not only litigate it, we will litigate it to the max. We will tie up as many resources as we can, and when you find him still guilty of the uh, violation of this idiotic regulation, we're going to pay his fine. 
And what I was saying, what if we had that on a huge scale? What if people who were prevented from going about their lives doing useful things, the kinds of things that uh, Philip uh, Howard has written about so eloquently, suppose you just started ignoring all those laws that were really stupid and you had this backstop uh, and you forced the curtain to be pulled aside on the Wizard of Oz, which is to say the government cannot conceivably enforce these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of rules with which they cover the land. They can't do it. They don't have the enforcement capability. They rely on our voluntary compliance. Let's withdraw that voluntary compliance. And do you want to comment on that or think about that? I saw you nodding or other things during that. I'm wondering what you were thinking. Put you on the spot. Yeah. Um, I think that's a great idea. Uh, if we could find some of those guys in the pinstripe suits and here I am. And <laughs> uh, thank goodness. And, uh, and a lot of white horses. I think we need a lot of white horses for this uh, idea. Yeah. And, um, and then we need to feed the horses. That'll be important. Um, and, uh, and then we have to make sure that the guys on the white horses in their pinstripe suits are actually lawyers and not pretending to be lawyers because we live in a country where people are always pretending to be what they're not. So that's a problem for the vision. So that's what I was thinking. I was thinking about the practical possibilities of this really splendid idea of, uh, and, um, and of course, even before it happens, it'll be a film, which will be too bad because then everyone will see the film and think that it's happened. <laughs> and, and therefore, they'll go home and feel very good about themselves because they will have seen this film in which a lot of really terrific lawyers on horses saved the day. It, it, it's, that's amazing. I mean, what's, what's, what's amazing is, I mean, from a, a serendipity point of view is how if, you know, we have tomorrow afternoon, Lawrence Lessig speaking, who's the founder of the May Day Packs, which is an attempt to create a series of crowdfunded plus billionaire white horses to come in and fund people running for office who will pledge to vote for campaign finance reform. And now we have um, Charles Murray trying, in a sense, to create a May Day pack uh, of a different form. And, and it's it, the, 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 the way, what I'm fascinated with in this whole conference so far is how there is a kind of uh, agreement or, or, or at least sympathy between people who are often thought to be on very different sides of political issues, that there's such a feeling that things are not working, that things have come apart, unwinding, lost so much, that there's uh, a real openness to radical new solutions that upend our political expectations. And I guess I wonder, we're, gonna, we're near the end, so anyone who wants to now to answer that, what possibilities are there of such new alliances between Charles Murray and Lawrence Lessig, right? Could, well, could I just add a, a, a codicil to that? Um, I, I think what, what, does, what, what I think is absolutely objectively true, and that is observed by people of very different political stripes now, is that we cannot expect the normal political process to rescue us. Um, from a person, from my perspective, uh, we look at uh, the election of Ronald Reagan and uh, or Republican Congresses, and as far as the expansion of government is concerned, it did no good whatsoever. Maybe slowed a few things, but that's all. From the point of view of the left, I'm sure that there are disappointments that they have uh, observed during the Obama presidency. But the, the, these are not because of flaws in the individuals who held those offices. It is the systemic corruption embedded in the system in Washington now that I think everybody on all sides says, yeah. you aren't going to get there from here yeah, if you're using it, the normal political it, process. Yeah, it's not possible to, to fix anything that anyone cares about, even when they disagree, without rebuilding the system. It is not, as a matter of physics, every, if George Washington were reincarnated and put in the White House, he could not deal with any of these issues because it would be, among other things, illegal. He doesn't have the authority to do anything sensible. We're so, and it's not the, that's not the only problem in our society either. 
agricultural, campaign finance, global corporate trends. There are lots of things going on here. But one of the things going on is it, it is illegal to make new choices. Mm -hmm. And so for the reason of the nursery and such. So we have to change the political narrative, first step, before we get to the, you know, to the, the insurrection. We have to change the political narrative from one of it's your fault, no, it's your fault, with both of them saying, oh, it's not my responsibility, with honesty, to one of we need to change the structure so that we can actually have fights and debates and make new choices about the environment, about everything else. And we don't have that narrative yet. We haven't, the media's complicit in the current system. They just talk about it as if it's business as usual. I actually think we need a woman president. And a woman would say, hey, this is all bullshit. You know, it's, it isn't working. Where guys kind of play the game. And um, in Washington, the whole culture of Washington, I have this idea we should move the national capital. No one will be able to move with it because they won't be able to sell their homes. <laughs> we'll get a whole group of people in St. Louis. It doesn't matter where. Spread them out around the country. So have a whole new group of people. It can become a national disaster area, and eventually Disney can take it over and hire everybody to do just what they're doing now, which is pretending to do something. You know, but the, 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 the point is really important because it really touches on um, uh, logistics, right? And the relation between institutions and logistics, which is really what, this, what we're talking about here. So you have this really kind of wonderful sense that we know that the institutions, the governmental institutions that exist simply aren't going to help. Okay, we give that, we give, we give up Washington and all the other capitals. Uh, but then you have this, then you have this really interesting problem um, of where and when and how, institu what institutions, if there are any institutions, or is it going to fold back on the moral authority of individuals, which I have very big doubts about, because I think we're so chaotic now that there couldn't be any single person, and I actually don't want to know that person, um, who could have that much moral authority. In this, in this kind of shattered space. I think it's an excellent point. We had a conference here two years ago on the question of does the president matter? Yeah. And one of the questions that was asked at that conference was, is there a president? Is there someone we could elect that could make a change, that could actually do something? Who would have that kind of authority? And people were you know, struggling to answer that at the conference. And basically, people said no. But the only two names that were ever sort of offered were Schwarzkopf and Petraeus. And, 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 the, and, and, and the, the reason is, is and, and, and well, this, listen to this, because it's, the, if you look at United States polling on what institutions are supportive, the only institution in this country that has over a 50% approval rating is the military. It's the only institution in this country. Now, now that may change. But that's also a very dangerous thing. You can think about that in a democracy to say that the military is the only institution with a 50% approval rating is an incredibly dangerous idea at a time when there is sense that nothing is working because that's an open invitation to you know what. I, but, what I, but I think what Anne and Philip here have raised as a question between them is, well, Philip says there's no institutions that are working. We need a an authoritarian individual or someone with no. authority. We need someone with authority. No, no, people. Authority people. In, the, in, the, in the Aaron set is, is provisional. They're always subject to someone else's authority. There's no person at the top. It's a circle. Okay. Roger. It's a traffic cop. Let, let me point out one institution I, that is rarely polled that, in fact, many people do think works, which has the power of life and death over citizens and that is the jury system. That is, we have some institutional forms whereby, for example, you take a dozen citizens, you put them in a room, you protect them from outside influence, and they make a decision that is widely trusted, can be debated, but With that's actually- The one group that doesn't trust them are lawyers. <laughs> lawyers are trying to do away with the jury system and have been for almost 100 years, just to put that out. 
I, um, I think it's really important to, I'm sorry, I think it's very important to, you know, Philip's stressing that it's not simply authority, but it's moral authority. And we don't understand what that means. We don't understand what morality is or where it comes from. The, you know, with, in the absence of a godhead telling us this is right and this is wrong, no one understands where this authority is to come from. But again, I'll go back to my best imaginary friend, William James, who uh, talks about how even giving up, if we give up the idea of a monotheistic absolute God and substitute for it any number of things, even if that idea is a little bit better version of ourselves the next day, that is to practice every day making a choice that improves your own relationship to the society and the world in which you live. And to, to teach that, to begin teaching that to our children, to our students, to one another, what, you know, what would that mean? And then someone who speaks of moral authority to understand that in, in, where does morality come? It's the mores, it's how we adjust ourselves to nature, to an environment, to a society. And it's about making... Right? We, need to, we need to end. Um, you have a, can you say it in... 10 seconds or 20 seconds? Yeah, yeah I can, I, I, even in less. I, I don't know where this moral authority is ever going to come from. There, there, there are many, many reasons why there isn't any moral authority, it seems to me. But what about, I was listening to a very well-known scientist saying that we have the technology to go to Mars in uh, 20 years, and we could have a settlement there. It could be the pilgrims, the, the new pilgrims. And they could have there's, a, there's actually a, mo a great movement that I, I had a student a couple years ago write about something called terraforming. I don't know how many of you are following this, but these are people trying to make out of synthetic uh, material new planets that would be put into orbit that we could then live on that were synthetically constructed to allow for life. And the terraforming movement are the new pilgrims. Um, I want to thank all of these panelists for today, and please join me in doing so.